Okay, I'm excited to continue in our messages this morning. Uh, we have been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, and so uh, if you would, we're turning to Matthew chapter 5 again. And uh, we've been talking about the Sermon on the Mount because I think as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we learn how to live like Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate king. He rules over all things. He had everything in order. He had everything he needed. And he took it all and he said, here's what I have. I, I give it to you. And so I love when he gives us instructions, just like he gave to the disciples. He told the disciples, uh, freely you have received, so what? So freely give. And that wasn't something he didn't instruct somebody to do something that Jesus wasn't first willing to do. And so last week, we were wrestling with um, some scriptures in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42. And, and as we looked at those, that passage of scripture talked a lot about retaliation. Hey, if somebody's going to whack you in the face and insult you, what should we do back? Thank you. Not, we're like, not, we, should, we should not respond in like kind, right? We should not respond in like kind. Because if we don't respond in lifetime, we don't respond evil for evil, why? This is an example of the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom that is established by love, not by authority, not by uh, diminishing others, but by lifting others up. It's, it also demonstrates that we trust God, that God will be the one that avenges us, and that we don't have to defend ourselves. So today is another deep message. Last week, we, we all were kind of like going and on and you know, tucking in our feet a little bit because I was stepping on some toes. Um, this, this week, it might be another week like that. But it's good news this morning that Jesus desires for us to look more and more like him. And so let's look at Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be reading this morning from verse 43 to 48. And we're going to examine again some words of Jesus that will instruct us how we, too, are to be able to live like King Jesus. Uh, the kingdom of God is established not by works. That's a reminder that we'll have throughout the message this morning. It, it, the kingdom of God is not established by works. <coughs> However, the fruit of a life changed by Jesus requires us, it demands us to live differently. So let's look here. Matthew chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 43, we're going to read through 48. It says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on evil and on good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what will your reward, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brother, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. Yep. Amen. Amen. Why do we say amen after we read something? Why do we say brother? Let it be so. It's so. Let it be done. That's true. That's what you guys think. I have a hard time hearing all the way up here. Sometimes when you guys, I was talking to somebody this week, I was like, hey, people talk. I'm like, I don't even know what you guys are saying sometimes. So if I give you a weird face, it's not because I want you to shut up. It's really because I just was trying to figure out what you're saying. But um, <laughs> amen. Let it be so. It's true. It's true. So verse, uh, let's look here closer at verse uh, forty. 4 to 45, because that's um, kind of like the basis to the whole Sermon on the Mount, kind of has this uh, identity statement. And so when we first read, and I first read it, uh, I, I, I struggled a little bit because I, I struggled with this, that sometimes I, I, I want to do something and, and then it to be true of me. We talked a lot about that as a first lie that the enemy gave to Adam and Eve, right? That they would eat the fruit and then they would become good. They would become like God, but they were already like God. And here in verse 44 and 45, let's look at it. It says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And when I first read these verses, I, I struggled with it a little bit, just like 
that, that urges against the gospel message, that the gospel message is one that we live and receive by faith and not by works, not by something we do. So the kingdom of God is uh, first and foremost not by works, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it reminds us of that. For it is by grace we have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself, right? This is the free gift of God. It's not by works. Why? So that nobody can boast, right? This isn't something that we want to, this is not something that we do or accomplish by the will of man, by our strength. Hey, we can work perfectly. We can work harder. We can do it all. No, this is something that has been given to us by God. And now we respond to it by, uh, by behaving and walking in the identity given to us, right? That we are sons and daughters of the Most High, right? That we are children of the light. Remember, we entered the kingdom of God with nothing. This is how the Sermon on the Mount began in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It wasn't by anything we did. It's not by anything we accomplished. It's not by some works we, we said, oh, by our merit. Now all of a sudden God said, oh, you're worthy of my kingdom. Here you go. Here's the free gift. No, uh, it, it is by coming to him and saying, God, I am nothing. I am in need of you, right? We were spiritually bankrupt. Mark chapter 10, verse 15, right? Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not, shall not enter it at all. Right? We receive this not by becoming something, but by admitting, hey, we're helpless just like a child. I'm still amazed at how helpless sometimes my child is. I think sometimes you take advantage of it. But, you know, as, as the kingdom of God comes, we, we come to him that, no, I, have helped. I cannot do anything. And then we receive the kingdom of God. And in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, it says this, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. For we receive Jesus and his kingdom by admitting that we are sick and in need of a spiritual physician, specifically and namely and only Jesus. Not earning the right to be called the children of God by completing the Sermon on the Mount. As we've gone through uh, list after list of, of commands that have been given by Jesus and, and redirected by Jesus, we don't do these things to receive the kingdom of God. We do these things because we have entered the kingdom of God. Because by faith we have said, Jesus, I need you. And when we say, Jesus, I need you, all of a sudden, by the grace of God, we have been, we have been made part of his kingdom. We're not earning the right by loving our enemy this morning. We aren't earning the right by not responding in like kind to those who insult us. We're not earning the right by not lusting. We're, we're not earning the right by being salt and light because of who we are in the kingdom as citizens of the kingdom. Those who have come to Jesus and said, I need you. This is what flows out of us. First and foremost, we have to remember the gospel is free. It is a gift to us. Just like Jesus said to the prostitute in Luke chapter 7, who was weeping at his feet, knowing the guilt, knowing she was trapped, knowing the results of the law, he says this, your sins have been forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go now and live like you've been forgiven. Go now. You have been made, uh, you have, your relationship now has been made right with the Father. Go and live likewise. When we look here at loving our enemies, it flows from this gospel truth. One, and first and foremost, that we were once enemies of God. We were once in desperate need of a Savior. We were once children, unknowing, unwavering, ungoing on our own way, and Jesus broke through. First Colossians 1.21 says this, that we were once enemies of God. As sons and daughters of God, 
who were once enemies, now Jesus instructs us, love your enemies and pray for them. Sometimes this is hard. Uh, this, uh, this is hard for me to, to wrap my mind around. Uh, this week, I had an opportunity to minister to some to local pastors. We kind of meet. There's a group of local pastors called the MP3 group, and we meet at different locations. And uh, so they asked me earlier in the year when they found out I became lead pastor. They said, "Hey, would you want to host in November?" I said, "Yeah, why not? You know, let's let's host." And then I found out, uh, you know, as the time grew closer, okay, there's going to be 30 pastors here um, who have all been in ministry 10 plus years. Some of them 30 plus years here in the city, and uh, I get to be the one that that teaches them, like open the word for them. And as we were opening the word, we I, I, I didn't preach any differently than I do on Sunday morning, so I just started talking about Jesus and the gospel with these ministers that have been in Addison for, for years. And then we had an opportunity to share communion together and speak the gospel to each other's needs. And one of the ministers was there that I had an opportunity to, to speak with and uh, he was sharing about some financial things and some financial struggles. And now that he's uh, now been serving in ministry for 30 plus years, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm getting closer to retirement and things are now looking, when I was younger, I could say like, by faith, yeah, you know, for everything for the kingdom, even if it means I, I won't have anything. Now he's, now he's later in life and he's realizing, wow, I don't really have everything that I, uh, and, and the fear is starting to set in. And I, ha I had an opportunity through the gospel uh, to remind him and to remind us of what has been already paid for us, right? That our sins have already been paid for. There was a debt that was owed. There was a, there was a, a bill that was due that was greater than anything we could ever owe. And God, in his great mercies and his great love, paid it for us. So how much more do these small things of life and retirement and security measure between the gap and the amount that God was willing to pay for our sins? And as we reflect on that as a group, it was hard for us to kind of like, uh, to, to grasp it. We were honest with each other. It's hard for us to grasp. Why? Because, you know, maybe, I, I think I confess a lot, my life isn't as beautiful as everybody thinks it is. I'm, I'm still a human, I still sin, I still need God's grace, right? But in, in the moment when I, when I think about it, we, we become so accustomed to the message of the goodness of Jesus that we don't really realize how great a measure, of, 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 of great a price it was that was paid for us. And so when we, when we think about this passage, and I say, like, first, uh, when I say Colossians 1.21, I say, hey, we were once enemies of God. In, in, our, in our minds, those of us that have maybe been around the church for a while, or maybe have heard the, the gospel message for a while, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, I was, yeah, I was an enemy of God. Great. And we don't really grasp how great a distance there was between us and the Father that needed to be gapped by Jesus, the perfect Son. But in order for us to follow this, in order for us to take heed to Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 48, we're, we're going to have to be able to put our faith in the fact or, or to truly believe that, hey, we were truly enemies, worthless, opposite, uh, and, you know, worth nothing to the Father. And in that state, not in the nice state that we have today, is, you know, I got my tie on, I got everything in order, I got my little family, I got my, my job, I got my life looks decent, at least I'm not like, hey, I can't relate to this, um, this passage of the, of the woman caught in sin, right? I, I, no, we were just like her. Jesus says, you've been forgiven. Go and live in peace. So as sons and daughters, as ones that have been rescued, as ones that were once enemies, as ones that were once apart, as ones that have been forgiven much, as ones who Christ came and loved and died and gave his all for us, as sons and daughters of God who were once enemies, this is how Jesus speaks to us. Love your enemies yes. and pray for them. We were once separated, but now we've been brought near. So who is our enemies? Verse 43, you've heard it said that 
you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to those say to you, love your enemies and, and pray for those who persecute you. It's easy to think about our neighbor, right? And I think about my uh, my neighbor. I had an opportunity to go to a football game yesterday, so I went across the hall and invited one of our neighbor's sons to come with me in Denver to the football game. And I have that picture of a neighbor, right? Those friendly faces we have, those, those ones we get coffee with or invite over for dinner or, hey, I don't mind them in my house. We can go play games together, right? Those are tend to what we think about neighbor or, or Mr. Rogers from the TV, right? I mean, right? That's, a, that's what a neighbor is. But but a neighbor is, is not just a friend or a brother. How do I know this? You guys may be familiar with the story in Luke chapter 10, verse uh, Luke chapter 10, 29, right? Of the Good Samaritan. Jesus was asked the question, uh, who is my neighbor? Right? He was given this instruction again. Love your enemy, love your love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, Who's my neighbor? And what does Jesus tell but a story of the of the Good Samaritan, right? And this is a story of, of a man that was was beaten, right? And there was religious people that had went by, and, and they were supposed to be neighborly to them. They were supposed to love their the love this person who was taken advantage of, and, and they didn't. They walked right past. They they had their religious rules. They had their religious indifferences. They they knew that they couldn't uh, help this individual. But then a Samaritan. Somebody in that time that represented somebody who religiously believed differently than me. But also, it was somebody that had racial differences than me. And this individual, the person that they thought was, was somebody that, was, uh, that, that shouldn't have, wouldn't have helped out, he go ahead and serve and go beyond and, and love this one that he wasn't even supposed to be near. It's not just love your neighbor and love your enemies. Jesus this morning is telling us, love your neighbor even if they're an enemy. So what kind of enemy? You know, are we talking about like uh, here? In, in Matthew chapter 5, it kind of walks us through a little bit. So in verse uh, 44, he says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So, first category of enemies that Jesus is, is talking about that, that we should love is, is those who, who persecute us, those who oppose us and even try to hurt us. And if I think about my context uh, here in Madison, Wisconsin, I, you know, I have a hard time finding people that would oppose me, even to the point uh, of hurting me. But I can think about my brothers and sisters in Christ that are in China. And in Sudan, and in Ethiopia, and Nigeria, and even our family that we support as a church uh, in southern Iraq. They're facing life or death for what they believe. They put their, their faith in Jesus, and people are coming at, after them, uh, not just in a way that is annoying. Maybe, maybe if some of us may think about our enemies and it's annoying, maybe it's a little inconvenient, some of the enemies that, that we may have, some of the people that may hate us and maybe they treat us a little bit disrespectfully. But no, these, uh, Jesus says, your enemy, those who try to hurt you. And Jesus says to the individuals here in this, this scripture, to us and to our, to our friends that are serving in other parts of the globe, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ that, that face real persecution where, where gunmen and bombs and, and threats are real to them in, the, in their worship of Jesus Christ, he, he says to them, love your enemies. If they kill you, love them. If they take your father, if they take your brother, if they take your mother, if they take their sister, love them. If they destroy your home and, and everything you've worked for, love them. Love your enemies. Be so changed on the inside of who you are by the free gift that has been given to you in the kingdom, full of love. Be so changed that it's possible to love them. But this passage of scripture also speaks to us in this room because it also talks about those who oppose us in less dramatic ways. 
In verse 45, it says this, So that you may be sons of the Father who is in heaven. For he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So here we find the evil or the unrighteous that is described as uh, are, are people that defy the laws of God, right? They resist his will. They don't submit to his authority. They're not uh, as mature in Christ as we are. They're people that are repeatedly, over and over again, resisting our desires. How many parents in the room, right? They're the rebellious child. They're the annoying upstairs neighbors who make a lot of noise. Oh, you know, I, I told you guys this story a few times about our upside, upstairs neighbors. So yesterday, I got an Uber to go downtown to the UW game. Do you know who was my driver? My upstairs neighbor. <laughs> and he invited me to go play ping pong with him. So I want to go make a friend. So no, yeah, I told him. He asked me, actually. He goes, do I, do I make too much noise upstairs? <laughs> I said, okay, Jesus. <laughs> I've complained enough. I said, no, your kids are great. They're so, they're so wonderful. <laughs> Three little kids. Because I, I asked Sheila if we could have a first floor uh, apartment. Anyway, pray for me. But I love my neighbors and their three little kids. Right? So our, 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 these individuals there, the uh, uncaring, not listening, ill-tempered spouse. They're the neighbor that complains about your yard that isn't cut like theirs. It's the politically different neighbor that has difference of opinions in you. It's those that you know are in sin and it irritates you. Love your neighbors. Love your enemies. Love them. Love them, even if they're different, because just as God loves the enemies, as he, he makes the sun rise on both the evil and the just. Man, that's hard, God. Love them. Anyone who doesn't love you or is not your brother, love them. Verse 46 through 47. For if you love those who love, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet other, uh, sorry, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Love even those who don't love you. An enemy is anybody who doesn't love you back. I remember a few weeks ago we were talking as we talked about marriage. And I love this definition of love. What is love that we would think about the other's greatest good at my greatest expense? It's really easy to love somebody who is loving me that way, right? They're thinking about my greatest. They're 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 encouraging me. They're lifting me up. All right, yeah, that's easy. Let me let me love you back. But but here it encourages us, right? It, it is not just those that and that love us that are, that are treating us in such ways. No, we are called to love even the one who doesn't love us. If you're just loving those who love you, you're not loving the way Jesus commands us. This requires us to go through those uncomfortable situations in order to love. Jesus requires us to go to those who are stuck in sin that are yucky to us. Jesus loves us in, in such a way that he went to us even when we were dirty to him. So don't stop loving a person just because he does things that offend you. That's what Jesus is saying this morning. Don't just stop loving somebody because he dishonors you. Don't stop loving because they've hurt your feelings. 
Don't stop loving because they've angered you or disappointed you. And don't stop loving because they frustrated you or threatened you or killed something you love or taken away your peace. Love your enemy and keep on loving them. This is great, Andrew. Love. All right, we've got this. Love. Think of their greatest and our greatest things. Great. But Jesus goes in here and gives us even greater examples of, of what this can look like. What, what does love mean? Tomorrow night, we have an awesome opportunity to do this love thing. Because first and foremost, that Jesus looks at here in verse 47, he says this. He, he says that we should love, and one practical way in loving is greeting people. All right, it's really great uh, when I look around the room when we're greeting one another. Everybody has friendly faces, right? It's pretty, it's pretty easy. Like nobody's like, like, like snubbing somebody around here, right? Nobody. I, I've seen some nice friendly faces. It's really easy to get around and say, "Hey, how you doing?" At least one person, even for for us for the introverts in the room. I think I think we're a pretty friendly faces group of people, right? But uh, but who do you greet after we leave this building? You know, there's a, I tell the story of a, of a neighbor of ours. There's nobody in the apartment complex greets this person. I don't even like to greet sometimes this individual, but we greet and we love. And who we greet and love, uh, sorry, who we greet shows the love that we have. Who do you host at your home? Is it just the ones that play the same games as you? Is it just the ones that, that enjoy the same things that you enjoy? Is it the ones who share the same opinions as you do? Tomorrow evening, we'll have 70 people coming through the doors. I don't even, uh, families coming through the doors. I, I don't know who they are. I don't know their background. We have an opportunity to greet them for who they just as. Christ would greet them with arms wide open, full of love, whatever they need. I hope that we find out some practical needs that we can meet. I hope that we find out some differences in how we can how we can come along beside of each other. We uh, one practical way of showing love is how we greet people, how we host people. God is a God who is full of hosp hospitality, who welcomed people into who He was. Jesus wasn't afraid. To get close to those who were totally different than him. He was a friend of sinners. Help me, God. Sometimes I don't want to bring people into my house because I'm afraid they'll take advantage of me. Jesus was one who was willing to open himself up to any individual. No matter what their background was. He was there with them. Now maybe there's some, some wisdom. I would say there's some steps of wisdom. Maybe don't do it alone. Maybe bring a friend with you, you know, if there's somebody. But, but love our enemies. Open up. Who are we greeting? Do who we greet reflect the love that has been shown to us through Christ? Second way that Jesus talks about uh, loving each other. I described it a little bit in verse 45, but he says this, For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust, right? So we see here that Jesus and God himself, he, he provides for the physical needs of both those who are good and righteous and those who are unrighteous. How do we show love? What does it look like to show love to our neighbor, even if they're our enemy? Meet their practical needs. Find out what they what what does it mean? What, what do you what do you have? What can I how can I help you? Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21. We said this last week, right? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Overcome evil with good. Love your enemy by meeting their practical needs. How can you help them out? How can you come alongside of them and serve them? Just as the King of Heaven, Jesus, came to earth and served us. It's these ordinary things of life that we can do to show the love of God. Amen. We never deserve the grace that has been given to us, but God gave it to us 
as a gift. So man, if it takes ordering another 50 pies so we can, we can bless another 50 neighbors, even if they're our enemies, hey, let's get some pies. Bring it to a neighbor. I've been encouraging you guys uh, to be pastoral for two seconds. All right, I've been encouraging us, if you, um, if you wanted to, you could have uh, signed up to get a pie for your neighbors. Nobody signed up to get a pie. So that tells me either one of two things. One, that you guys all plan to go to Costco yourself, or pick and save, and get a pie and, and give it to your neighbor, which I still encourage you to do. Or, you decided you didn't want to get a pie for your neighbor. I don't know which one it is, but as your pastor, I want to encourage you, get a pie and give it to your neighbor. You have to say that, that, and you guys can do that. Because what? Because we have to know who our neighbors are. We're called as a people of God, not just to have beautiful moments of worship, guys. Like, I love Sunday mornings, I love Wednesday nights, I love Fridays, I love the times that we spend together. I love the times that we get to be in the presence of God and say, God, you're, you're awesome, you're holy, you're worthy. I love playing instruments. And during the week, I can get up here when you guys aren't around. I mean, like, I love it. But we are called not just to be people of God's presence, we are called to be people who go and share what has been done for us. And so, Pastor, why have you encouraged us to get a pie and give it to our neighbors? Because in that simple gesture of kindness, we are able to open doors for us to share the goodness of who Jesus is. We are to live lives that are peculiar, that are different, so that others may see Christ in us. And our prayer is, and we'll see the next step here. First, it's, it, 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 it's, the first it is to greet those and to examine who we're greeting. Secondly, it's to, it's to provide practically for the needs of those who are around us. But third, it is to pray. What is the next step of love? What does love look like? Love looks like praying radically for our enemies, for our neighbors. How can we pray for them if we don't even know their names? I'm talking to myself too. There's neighbors I don't even know. Pray for them. Verse 44, right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Prayer is one of the deepest forms of love. Because it means that you really do want something good to happen in their life. You really do want what is best for them. Oftentimes I find that I can sometimes, or oftentimes I find that I can do good without desiring what's best for them. But to intercede on their behalf brings blessings from heaven to bear down on them. It may be for their repentance and for their salvation that they would be spiritually set free, that they would come to know Christ, right? That they would be awakened from their blind state, that they would stop their downward spiral of sin, right? That, that they, could, they could pray that they would be... Uh, Whole in Jesus, right? This is how Jesus prayed for his neighbor, his enemies on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Right? Luke 23. Stephen, when he's getting stoned, when people were taking his life, Acts chapter 7 says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. How are you praying for your neighbors who may also be your enemies? Not just do good, not just greet them. We pray for them and we bring them before the Lord because we want their best. We want all that God has to bear down on them. 
all of his blessings that we've experienced to come to them. Pray in this way. Pray that they would be forgiven. Pray that they would be set free. Pray that they would have all that they need. Don't just pray in spite of them. So annoyed with them. God, get them. I don't think that's the heart in which Jesus prayed on the cross. Lord, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Stephen, don't hold this against them. No, then again, sometimes my prayer is like, no, hold it against them, Lord. Get them. They deserve it. They <laughs> destroy them. Love looks like desiring that they would receive the same grace and mercy that we've received. Paul, another example. For the Jewish uh, people who were persecuting him and making his life miserable. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, he says this, My heart's desire and my prayer to God is for their salvation. We need to pray that just as we humbly accepted the words of truth, that they would also humbly accept the words of truth. Understanding this, this is how we are to love our neighbors, even if they're our enemies, we must first and foremost understand that we were once the enemies of God, brought near by his act of love and sending his son Jesus in our place. So now when we see these words, Matthew chapter 5, we say, oh Lord, what you have done to me, Lord, help me to do to others. And again, as I say every week, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, right? We, he doesn't require something he, he hasn't done to us first, and he doesn't require us to do it on our own. No, he says that if we humble ourselves before him, he will give us grace, he will give us the strength needed to love others the same way that he's loved us. And so this morning, we have that same opportunity to ask the Lord, Lord, help me to receive and understand the love that has flown from you to me so that I may be one who can truly greet those who are totally different than me. That I can truly be one who hosts them. That I, I can truly be one who meets their practical needs, even if they don't look like me, even if they're politically different than me, even if they have sin issues that I, I'm opposed to, even if they don't even know you. Lord, help me to to greet them. Help me to meet their needs practically. Help me, Lord, that I would be able to pray with them. Not that you would smite them and destroy them, but that they would receive the same message of grace and truth that I have received. And the Lord says that when we ask Him in that way, Lord, help me to do this. He says that He will extend His grace with us. And we will do it not by our own strength, but by His strength. Let's pray this morning. Father, I am so grateful for your words this morning who, that speak to the innermost parts of, of who we are. Father, and challenge us in our expressions of love. God, I pray that we would be a people who love well, just as you have loved us. May we be able to return that to others. Lord, help us to to love by, by greeting those even who are different than us. Lord, help us to host well, just as Jesus, you are one who is a friend of sinners. Lord, encourage us in meeting others' practical needs, Jesus, just as you met our every need. And God, I pray that you would encourage us to pray for those who are our enemies that they may find salvation, that they may find the same hope that we have in you. Jesus, as we take time to reflect on your words this morning, I pray your Holy, would, Holy Spirit would speak to us in ways that we can walk this out, in ways that we need to repent for our unbelief. In Jesus' name. I want to encourage you.